Good morning, everyone. It's fabulous to be with you again this morning. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you to those who have already uh, signed in to say hello. Uh, I'm seeing the comments and, the, um, and those who have joined uh, popping up beside me here. So thank you so much for, uh, for all of you. It's great to see the Craigs here again this morning. Um, Laura and Sheila, hello, Susie. Uh, Heather, Christine, Jill, everybody, all the McKittricks are there. Um, it's brilliant to see you. Whether you're, uh, if you are watching and, and you want to say hello, please do leave a, a comment in the sections. It would be uh, wonderful to to see you and uh, see hear from you in that way. Um, and so it is fabulous to have you with us this morning. Um, today we're going to be continuing through our uh, series that we started last week, uh, beginning in the Book of Acts. Uh, and so we'll get there uh, towards uh, the second half of our service. Uh, Tim is going to be leading us this morning, which is a great privilege and, and it's delightful to have him with us. Uh, we're also going to be hearing uh, from a couple of other, uh, from a family uh, from within our fellowship. The Hendersons are going to join us a little bit later on too. So uh, so it is wonderful that we can do this together and, and in some ways be together, even though this is very odd times. So it's great to see uh, Susanna, and Michael and Elizabeth. Hello, Glennis, Adam, good to see you this morning. Uh, Tim, great to see you and we will be hearing from you soon. Johnsons are all here. Williamson's, hello. Uh, the McFerrins have signed in twice. Thanks, Jonathan. That's great. Um, it is uh, it is great to, to see you this morning. It's brilliant to gather uh, virtually like this, uh, but I hope that you do feel uh, that we are gathering as a church family as we gather. Uh, it is wonderful to, to know that you're there watching. Uh, it might feel strange for me to stand in this room on my own, but it's delightful to, to see the comments coming through, to know that you're, you're there. We are with one another, um, certainly in spirit. Uh, so we, we long for the day when we can get back together again physically and sing together and pray together, read God's word together, study together. Um, but for now, uh, this is what we have. And I think we're, uh, we're enjoying this time when, when we gather together. Um, but as we've said many weeks, uh, let's not get too comfortable with it. Where uh, church in your pajamas might be uh, exciting for now. Uh, but when we, we long for the day when we can gather back together again. Um, and so this morning, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to be continuing on in our series and acts. Uh, we're going to be singing together. We're going to be praying together. We're going to be uh, sharing a little bit together as we hear from the Hendersons. Uh, towards the end of our time together, we'll be uh, sharing communion with one another. And so um, wherever you are, whoever you're with, if you're with anyone at all, uh, we invite you to join us in that and, and I'll lead us through that time later. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, Tim is going to lead our time for us this morning and, and call us to worship. And so uh, let me hand over to Tim. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to gather again this morning, um, albeit online, and to share with one another, uh, to worship God, and to hear from his word. Um, so whether you have been part of Gilnaher Baptist for a long time, and we're meeting with us regularly before lockdown, or whether you're new, and you've just come across us online on Facebook, um, a big welcome to you as well. And if you are new, please do drop a comment below, um, or drop us an email, um, so we can keep in touch with you, um, check in with you, and, and keep uh, making sure that everything's all right. And you're more than welcome with us um, this morning and then to be a part of our activities online during these um, unusual and uncertain times. A few weeks ago, at the start of this pandemic, um, as part of our life group, we um, looked at Psalm 23 together. And there were parts of that that just really rang true to us so much at that time. Um, I'm sure many of you will already know Psalm 23, maybe even off by heart. Um, but let me read it together um, now with us, um, just as we... Um, set out on our service today. Um, so Psalm 23 says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I think at the time when we were uh, looking into those passages together, um, we were set just at the outset of the pandemic. And there's a lot of fear. And there's a lot of unknown, a lot of uncertainty. And to an extent, maybe not an awful lot has changed, apart from a little bit of additional time. Um, and verse 4 in that um, passage really was a comfort to us. Um, the fact that we um, can fear no evil, for God is with us. Uh, and we, he is there to comfort and help us. 
But this morning, I just want to quickly turn our minds to, to verses 2 and 3. Um, as I've been reading the psalm again this week for myself, those verses have become a real comfort. I don't know what it has been about this week, um, but I know for myself and for many others, this week has just been really tough um, for various different reasons. Um, I don't know whether it's just a little bit of lockdown fatigue, whether it's um, just a struggling with some of the day-to-day -day things that are now uh, a new normal. But I think the reality is life as we once knew it has changed, possibly for a longer time than maybe we hope and possibly in some aspects um, forever. But with this change, with this completely change in how uh, life goes on, we have an invitation from God here to come, to find rest, comfort and peace in him. For some of us at the moment, life is maybe a little bit slower and we don't have friends and family calling in with us as much. We don't have uh, work to go to. We maybe don't actually have any work on at all. Um, we maybe have that the, the lack of busyness with more organised activities that we were maybe previously involved in. So we maybe have a bit more time. For some of us, um, life might actually feel a heck of a lot busier. Um, we maybe have children to homeschool and um, the challenge of working from home and maybe even marrying those two together. Um, we have maybe lots of video calls, which can be quite exhausting for some people. Um, we actually, in some cases, maybe be looking at some of the people in that first group with a little bit of envy. Um, you know, who, some who maybe are saying that they're a little bit bored with nothing to do and thinking, wouldn't that be lovely? But we're, regardless of how we're finding things at the moment, God, through the psalmist, is inviting us to come and to rest. To step back from the schedule which um, we're in, whether that's a busy schedule or a little bit more relaxed schedule, and to come to find green pastures, to come and find uh, some quiet waters. Um, they're not likely going to be physical because at the minute we're not allowed to travel too far and for some people that might actually be um, a bit of a problem but we're invited to come and be restored um, by spending time with God. A friend of uh, Kelly and I uh, wrote a post in this verse um, a few days ago and I'd just like to share that as we come to worship God and um, to help us uh, draw our minds to him. Um, the post starts like this. Uh, there's a line I like to tell myself. It goes a little something like this. If only I had more time. Every 24 hour period filled with endless to do's, 1,440 minutes filled with really must do's, and 86,400 seconds filled with probably should do's. Jobs to complete, people to see, routines to keep, meetings to attend, and agendas to follow, roles to fulfill, tasks to accomplish, no time to stop, no time to slack. This was life, life as we knew it, life as we liked it, busy. Yet today life looks different. Appointments are cancelled, plans postponed. Dates changed, schedules rescheduled, arrangements rearranged. Diaries now blank and calendars now empty. All of a sudden that familiar fast pace of day to day life came to an unexpected stop. At last for some the gift of more time, although was it ever really more time that was needed? The same 24 hour period comes and goes just as it did before. Yes, life may look a little different, but life is still busy. Netflix to binge, video calls to make, gardens to tend, children to homeschool, cupboards to sort and rooms to redecorate. Yes, more time, just more time to do stuff. I suppose for many of us life has changed and we are filling our life in many different ways now. For the better or for the worse. But this morning, and going into the next uh, few weeks, let us look for quiet waters. Let us look for that the opportunities to, to go to those green pastures and to refresh our souls by spending time with God. We might find that some of the, the worries and the concerns that we have might be eased as we spend more time with Him. Some of those hardships that we're maybe struggling with, we can have that burden uh, shared with Him. So that's common. Refresh our souls with God and let's look for those quiet waters, those green pastures and those times and where we can spend time with him. Before we sing, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this morning we can come, take time out of our schedule to come uh, before you again. To come to hear from your word, to come talk to you, to come to 
to share time with one another, even if it is virtually online. And Father, we ask that whatever stage we're in at the moment, whether we're um, full of joy, whether we're full of sorrow, whether we are full of energy or whether we need picked up, whether we um, are on fire for you or maybe, Father, straying from you. Father, will you bring us um, to you? Will you give us that comfort and that rest and that peace um, that comes from times with you? Will you bless our time together this morning? Will it be a time of refreshing for us all? We ask it in your name. Amen. So this morning we're going to sing uh, two songs together. And the first one, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And the second, He Will Hold Me Fast. Again, a big thank you for to Jonathan Ray for um, producing these video, um, one of these videos. Um, and then the second video um, is from friends of mine, the Cowans, um, who work with uh, Music Ministry. And again, another Christian music resource that are making videos available for Trishas to use during this time. Um, so thanks to um, all their um, providing input for us for these services. But without any further ado, let's join together. Let's proclaim these truths um, to one another in our house. Um, if you're living alone, get those windows cracked open. And it might not be a, a tuneful noise, but it might be a joyful noise. Let's, let's sing out these truths and proclaim them to, to ourselves and, and to those around us. And let us do so finding rest and peace in our God. Yeah. 
As Tim had mentioned, we just want to say thank you to those who are helping us with our, our music ministry, particularly at the minute. Thank you to Jonathan and, and the Ray family. And thank you there to the Cowans. And just another example of people serving. I, I, I felt the Cowans were, uh, they felt very like us, didn't they? Uh, whenever we gather, there's very often kids involved in one shape or another. So a uh, big thank you to them. As, as we come again, can I pray for us? Um, and then we're going to, to sh share some announcements and, and move on with the rest of our service. So Father, we thank you for... Uh, the joy of gathering together, even in this strange way. Uh, but we thank you, God, that we can still gather. And so we thank you and praise you for the technology to do this. We thank you uh, for the, the privilege we have, Father, of, of high-speed internet, of, of warm homes to enjoy uh, company with one another, but also uh, this kind of fellowship together. Uh, God, we don't take any of these gifts for granted, and we, we praise you, we thank you for them. And Lord, as we continue with our service now, we pray that you would indeed be glorified. Uh, you would be exalted in our time together, Father. Uh, may we know your presence with us, indeed our presence with one another by your Spirit. And so come, Father, and be exalted, we ask. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I thought I would just share some uh, announcements with you. Um, and uh, I've just uh, had a... Had a, a text to remind me that um, May is a month of birthdays in church, uh, and I, and I realise I will miss some, and I'm sorry if I do. Uh, it is purely because I, I I don't know or don't know the exact date um, to hand. Uh, but it's Jacob Hutton's birthday today, so a big uh, happy birthday to Jacob. I uh, hope you have a great day. Uh, it's probably different than what you had planned, but I uh, hope you have a cracking day, whatever you get up to. Um, in terms of other family announcements, church family announcements, um, I'd love to invite invite you to our prayer meeting this evening. Uh, eight o'clock on Zoom. Um, and so if you uh, don't normally receive church emails, um, please do let me know uh, either email info at gilnerhirkbaptist.org.uk or just send a message through the Facebook page and we'll make sure that your email address is added to that list. And in that email that will go out this afternoon, uh, there'll be a, a link to, to access the Zoom prayer meeting. So that's prayer meeting tonight from eight o'clock to in around nine o'clock. <clears throat> and if you, um, and if you, uh, Want to hang around after that? Uh, there'll be no one rushing away, so please do hang around that way. Uh, life groups this week then will continue to meet uh, from eight o'clock Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, uh, and so they will be um, on Zoom again. So your leaders will be in touch uh, again. I'll say if you haven't uh, joined up with a life group yet, um, or it's not part of your regular rhythm, please do uh, let us know. We'd love to plug you in. Equally, if during this season you would just like to see and, and be with other members of your church family and therefore join a different life group than your normal one, please do uh, let us know. We'd be more than happy to facilitate that, um, especially in these days. Uh, and then next Sunday we'll be gathering again uh, virtually online. And so 11 a.m. we'll be back here for our, our next installment in our Acts series. So that's on the 10th of May. We'd love to see you there. Um, I'd love at this stage, uh, I think that's all I have to share. We'll, we'll send out any more information through our emails, uh, so please do keep an eye on those. Um, but for now, what I'd love to do is to read the Bible passage that we're going to be looking at a little bit later. Um, then we're going to hear from the Hendersons, uh, and then we're going to pray together. So uh, let me read God's Word. It's Acts chapter 8. Um, if you have a copy of God's Word, you might find it helpful to, um, to find that spot uh, and read along with us here. Um, if that's helpful for you, we're going to turn to this passage later as we uh, hear from God's word. So Acts chapter one, uh, Acts chapter eight, sorry, beginning of verse one, we're going to read through to verse 25. So on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem 
and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time a man named Simon had practised sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptised, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. And so we're going to unpack those words together uh, later in our service as we continue on in this new series that we've uh, started last week uh, in the book of Acts, in this middle section of the book of Acts. Um, And so it's my great pleasure to to lead us in that later on, and we pray for God's blessing on on the public reading of his word. Uh, I'd love first now, as I mentioned, to to meet up with the Hendersons. Uh, for those of you who are regularly part of our, our church gatherings here, uh, you may be familiar with a, a slot that we do sometimes on a Sunday morning called This Time Tomorrow, uh, which is essentially trying to figure out where we are and what we're doing and how we can pray for one another this time tomorrow, i.e. about 25 past 11 on a Monday morning. How do we fill our weeks in between? And so uh, I thought even in, even in this season, uh, routines might be different for many of us, uh, but we are still uh, with one another, encouraging one another, wanting to spur one another on and pray for one another. And so uh, I, I asked the Hendersons to, in a sense, be the guinea pigs to see how this would happen. Uh, and so uh, I had a chat with them during the week, uh, and here's that conversation. They're, they're going to begin by introducing themselves, just in case you're not familiar with who they are. So here they go. Okay, I'm Nicola Henderson. Um, um, and usually, usually I'm on a Monday morning, I'll be in Queen's University, uh, where I'm uh, doing admin work. Um, so I'll usually all have got everybody out of the house and driven with a friend into work. Okay, I'm uh, Mark Henderson, Nicola's husband, and uh, on a on a Monday, I'm usually Monday morning, I'm usually getting up. Unfortunately, I'm able to drive these two into school. I work in Hollywood as a civil engineer, so I go to the office in in Kinniger, and I'm usually walking into the office and going upstairs to the first floor to an open plan office with about 35 people on one floor. So sitting down at my computer to look at drawings and things that need to be built. Um, I'm Karis and um, usually I'd probably be in class um, in Sullivan at first going in Hollywood um, just with my friends and my classmates. So. I'm Luke. I go to Solvon Upper School as well, and I'd be going to the exact same thing, but obviously different classes, different people, my classmates and friends. And so um, I assume lockdown has meant you're all at home now, so what does a Monday morning look like now? 
Well, the fight usually breaks up about half nine, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it's actually it's actually works out quite well because um, on on the weekdays, Nick and I are both working from home, so I actually get the kitchen from nine o'clock to one o'clock. So, Karis and Luke, you have, your, you have your breakfast at about. Oh, yeah. We're being forced to wake up early. Yeah. Mum right. always kicks me out of bed. Dad leaves the kitchen. Get out, have your breakfast. <laughs> so they, 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 they. I, I bring the computer downstairs at about ten to nine, set up, and by nine o'clock, I've up two screens in the kitchen table, and uh, I'm, I'm ready to go. And these two have cleared the table and made their way to their bedrooms to. Start doing some school work. And I, I get the office from nine to one upstairs, so I feel very privileged. Um, where a lot of it's just meetings over the computer um, and trying to keep up, I'll keep up with everything that's going on in work. Very different, but it works okay. We're in a bit of a routine now, I think, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite fortunate. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask, you know, how how have you found the adjustment to it all? I mean, even are there are there positives in it as well as obviously the the challenges that a lot of us are going through, but um, how would you how would you judge the whole thing if you could? Well, I, I think um, it's quite strange that I do find there's some positives, but there's every now and then you get a day and you just think this is completely crazy. This, you know, and it, it takes a while for your head to get around it. But um, I probably, for a certain amount of time, enjoyed getting a bit of headspace and working from home. And yeah, it's been it's been quite nice not having the commute. I'm not missing sitting in traffic, trying to get in on time, ready to park. Um, so that's quite nice. And then not having to rush to pick the kids up and get them home. So it's been, um, from that point of view, it's been a bit more relaxed. Um, uh, and obviously we're having things on in the evenings in the same way. So that, that's, that's been quieter as well. So that's quite a positive thing. But I'm missing seeing my friends at work. You know, it's very strange. It's it's definitely different, but I wouldn't say it's really any better or worse because there's a lot of there's a lot of things I like about it where I can just sort of be alone and work through my work alone and uh, then maybe listen to some music at the same time. But um, obviously, there's not really that level of interaction. There is when you go to school. Like yeah, there's also not as much, but there's not as much stress as there would be. Like at mm. school, it can be quite stressful, so it's quite nice to be at home and not have that stress on <laughs> you. And uh, what about your evenings? How are you filling those? Have you rediscovered all the board games in the attic or what way of family time been, been going? <laughs> We've been doing a board game competition at night, every nice. other night, but we tried to at the start. It's kind of yeah. it slipped away. We were good the first couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> we were trying to get back into doing a few more board games, um, doing some calls with family and friends, trying to catch up with people. Um, I know you guys have been... Harris has been doing. Yeah, with my extra group in school. Um, we do Zoom every Monday and Thursday. So I do Alpha every day at the minute. So, okay. Get a bit of exercise. I suppose we're getting some regular exercise in as well in the, in the evenings. Get a, get a walk in, uh, do the loop, or we call it the big loop <laughs> that, that goes round onto Knock and then up the, the lower Branya. Or maybe get a cycle into Hollywood just, just to get out for an hour. And I've also discovered that I've, I've become a barber. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my new part-time job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in, in terms of uh, church stuff, how have you been finding that online experience or uh, even just day-to-day -day in terms of faith? How, how, have, you, how have you been uh, continuing on in your walk with God? Well, I, for the church, uh, the church on the Sunday, uh, we, we have really, really enjoyed it. And uh, it's great having you on a 50-inch TV in our <laughs> front living room with us in the morning. So. But uh, no, no, we, we, have, we have really, really enjoyed it. And uh, I also think, I was, think I was saying to you before, Drew, just the fact that it's live actually brings so much normality to, to the Sunday morning. And we've been able to also share the link with family. You know, I've been able to share it with my family, you know, partic particularly just before the, the Easter service, because my parents were at home. I thought my dad would usually be going to church. I was able to share the link. There's a friend of yours, Nick. 
was was dialing in. Um, I find that it's easier to get a, a, a bit of time in the mornings before you start work. You know, if you're not actually, if you're still in the house at a quarter to nine, you can actually, it's easier to get a bit of time to, you know, read your Bible, you know, before you start work. Whereas before you were, you were all rushing out of the house. So it's probably been a bit more time for that from my point of view. Yeah, it's been it's been it's been good to do church together in the in the front room. Um, the sing the singing's not not great. <laughs> Just talk for myself. Um, <laughs> but um, one of, one of the things that actually was making me laugh was recently Luke was trying to get some juice out of the cupboard, and I was saying, no, 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 not that one. That's the communion juice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, so he's not allowed to drink cupboard juice. That's the communion juice. <laughs> great. Sorry, Luke. Um, how, how can we be continuing to pray for for you guys? Look, I think that for me that we should use the, use the time effectively, you know, it's, it's hard going, you know, there's that aspect, but I think it's a, it, it's a good opportunity to, to use the time. I think it's a good opportunity to, to come closer to God, but I also think that, that we just pray that we can keep, keep positive. I mean, it's just going to get harder as, as this goes on and um, it's hard to see the end in sight. I think I think as a family we've been quite blessed that I mean we're, we're all well you know we're all able to work from home um, we're very lucky that we have a home space and I'm aware there's a lot of people don't have that so you know I, I do feel very very blessed and very aware a lot of people don't have that and it's maybe not as easy or they're maybe not working at all you know so I'm very mindful of that. Well sometimes getting work done by yourself can be a bit harder mm. I struggle with a bit of procrastination sometimes and I don't know, sometimes you end the day and you haven't got enough work done and you feel a bit bummed about it. Let me pray that you just keep focused. Maybe just that, um, just like, because we're not really getting the social interaction we'd have with our friends, it's quite hard. Even like when we do meet up with them, it's kind of hard to, what to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good that Luke's been doing the Bible class. So we have the Bible class. And then Matt's been doing the My SU group, so. That's brilliant, guys. Thank you so much. It's great to uh, not only get an insight into your house, and um, but even just life and how it is at the minute. And um, so thank you for sharing. Thank you for being willing to, uh, to join with everybody and to share a bit of your story. So It is wonderful to uh, get an insight into, into people that we would normally be bumping into week after week. Uh, and so thank you to the Hendersons. Um, and we're going to pray now. And um, we're going to pray. Uh, for for the Henderson family, for one another, uh, for uh, issues going on in our world. And so um, I'd just like to gather our thoughts again around where Tim started our time this morning around Psalm 23. Uh, this is the God who we're coming before. Uh, and so um, I'll pray for a little bit and then I'm going to leave a time of quiet for uh, you to bring your own uh, thoughts, prayers. Uh, even if you're if you're with others, you may want to pray together. Um, but let's, uh, let's come before this God who hears our prayers. The, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. So let's come before uh, this, this shepherding God. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for uh, the wonder of, uh, of being able to know you, uh, to know your love. Uh, thank you, Father, for how you have demonstrated that love to us in the person of Jesus, how you have called us to follow uh, you through him. Uh, Father, we thank you for... Uh, the reality of being part of your family and, and in that family God we we share this great love and care for one another uh, and so we do pray for the Hendersons God I thank you for them and um, I thank you Father for the experience that they've had even through these days that you have sustained them uh, Father that you have been with them helping them God to use the time wisely as they've said and, and God we pray that that would continue uh, thank you, God, for uh, keeping them safe, for the, the physical and electronical blessings they know uh, in being able to continue on with relative normality um, in these situations. But, God, we pray for them, and, and we, we pray your continued uh, presence in their home. Uh, God, that they would indeed use the time wisely, Father, that the, the time not only gathered around uh, the big TV on a Sunday, but, but the whole, uh, everything in their home would be uh, just peppered and, and fragrant of your, your presence. Um, so I thank you for them. God, we pray that you'd help them to uh, keep that, that, that positive um, attitude that comes from knowing that you are in control of this. You've got this. And, and even when things get difficult, Father, uh, your presence is true. Um, your love is secure. Um, God, I, I pray that you would help uh, Karis and Luke as they try to um, balance the, the work and being at home and doing everything at home. 
Um, Lord, even from a socializing point of view, God, would you help them to know that they're not alone and that, that they're very much uh, with you, with us. Uh, God, I thank you for uh, the way in which the SU group and the, the Bible class have been able to continue. And Lord, I pray that that would continue to, to be a real source of strength and comfort, um, not only in that social aspect, but Father, in their, in their walks with you. Would you uh, continue to sustain them and build them up, God, we pray. So we thank you for the Andersons. We pray your blessing upon them. Um, and, and Lord, as we think of them, we too do uh, imagine that the, uh, and in our mind's eye, we can see the, the other members and, and people that we would be rubbing shoulders with on a Sunday morning. And we pray for them now. Uh, God, I pray for those who, who are struggling in these days, uh, struggling with uh, their own health issues, maybe uh, struggling, Father, with, um, with loss and with grief, um, whether that is of, of, of uh, sadly individuals that have been lost in these days or, or even events and plans that have had to be put on hold. Uh, and there is that sense of loss. God, we pray that your comfort would be there and present with them. Um, we pray specifically, Father, for uh, Lorraine as she continues to mourn the loss of her father. Uh, God, would you comfort her, we ask, in these days. Um, Father, I pray that you would strengthen us too, uh, that we would be able to uh, not just survive this strange time, but, Father, we would thrive in it, uh, thrive in our relationship with you in these days, but thrive, Father, in our witness for you to those that we do get the opportunity to rub shoulders with or communicate with over, over internet stuff or, or Father, just in, in our attitude and in our everyday, Father, that there will be something uh, of your presence uh, that goes with us everywhere we go and that we share that um, with those we interact with. And God, we do pray uh, on, a, on a wider scale, a national scale, a, a global scale, even for um, the circumstances and surrounding COVID-19. Father, we ask you, uh, we'd continue to bestow your wisdom upon those decision makers. Father, we ask for uh, many, many, many good conversations, even godly conversations to be taking place in those corridors of power. And Father, that there would be a real um, reshaping of priorities and uh, a real understanding of, of who you are in the midst of all of this. And Father, that, that society as a whole would, um, would come to know you as our Lord and our King through what's going on. So, so bestow your wisdom, we pray, on our leaders. And Father, there are so many other issues that we want to bring before you. And so God, in the, in the quiet, uh, we want to bring those before you now. And we pray um, that, that as we pray together, God, you would hear our prayer. And that we as individuals praying together would be comforted um, by your presence uh, with each one of us guiding us through. So, so hear our prayers, we ask in your name. And so, Father, as our good shepherd, we pray that you would indeed hear our prayer in your mercy and you would answer in accordance with your will for your glory, Father, and for, uh, for the good of those who love you. So we thank you, God, and we ask your blessing upon us as we, as we turn to your word now, God, would you guide our thoughts? And would you help us, Father, um, as, we, as we wrestle with such richness and the, the, the wonder of your word to us uh, through the Bible? God, would you speak powerfully, we pray. And it's in your wonderful name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. We are going to turn now to God's Word. And so uh, if you have a copy of, um, of the Bible in front of you, please do uh, grab that. Maybe it's on a device and so you want to uh, be scrolling through there to Acts chapter 8. Um, if you're watching and you don't have a copy of, of God's Word and you would like one, please do let us know. We'd love to send one out to you um, just so that you have one, uh, so that you can see God's Word for yourself and, and read the, the joy that's in it. Um, but today, as I mentioned, we're going to continue... Uh, with the series that we launched last week through the portion in the book of Acts. Um, as we said last week, we, uh, we we looked at the first chunk of Acts, so from the very opening of the book through to chapter 6, verse 7. We looked at that back in 2018. And so if you want to go back and check those messages out, please do. They're still on the website or on the podcast. Um, but from now until the summer, then we're going to explore from chapter 6, verse 8, through to the end of chapter 12. And it's a, it's a wonderful section of this great book. As, as we see the, 
Church of Jesus Christ, the first Christians uh, move from the, the safety of Jerusalem to the regions around them. And as we said last week, in essence, it follows the second stage of the, the blueprint that Jesus himself laid out. In, in Acts 1 verse 8, we see Jesus himself saying, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so from the beginning of the book, uh, right up until chapter 8, we see the church in Jerusalem. And now, as a result of what we saw last week with the death of Stephen, uh, we see the church scatter from Jerusalem to the surrounding areas uh, of Judea and Samaria. And that's why uh, we've called this series The Church on the Move. Um, and we can see, as we turn our attention now to, to Acts chapter 8, um, we can see from the first three verses of that chapter uh, that this was a deeply unpleasant time for the and troubling time for the early church. Just look at those first three verses. On that day, a great persecution, that day being the day that Stephen died, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. This was a this was a horrendous time for the early church. This new community who had been enjoying and sharing all of life together. We read about it in Acts 2, 42 to 47. This example of, of sharing teaching, of worshipping together, of fellowshipping in that true sense of the word. And this new community is now being ripped apart. And, and the language here in verse 3 of Saul's treatment of the church is violent language. He, he begins to destroy the church. Indeed, the ESV and other translations uh, take that term destroy and talk about how Saul ravaged the church. And that, that sense almost of a, of a wild animal tearing its prey apart. This was, this was brutal, what was happening to our early brothers and sisters. But as we saw last week, uh, this man, Saul, his treatment of the church was far from the end of the story. Far from the end of his story, far from the end of the story of the church. You see, Saul, the persecutor here, who we meet in these verses, is then met by Jesus in Acts chapter 9. He's transformed by Jesus. He becomes one of the greatest heralds of the good news of Jesus the world has ever known. He becomes the Apostle Paul. And so Saul's story doesn't end in chapter 8, and neither does the churches. God, as we saw last week, had bigger plans going on. And so as we see Saul trying to stamp out the early church, of course, God's plan was bigger than that and far from it. In fact, John Stott actually says, instead of smothering the gospel, persecution succeeded only in spreading it. Of course, that was God's plan all along, that, that his church would grow and spread and, and many more would be welcomed into his family along the way. That, that's what we see in Acts 1.8. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so that's the context in which we're picking up here in chapter 8. The church is on the move from Jerusalem out and out to Judea and Samaria, just as Jesus had said. And so today we're going to see the first encounters that take place as the church moves. And the majority of chapter 8 focuses on the experience of one man, Philip. Uh, but let's not skip over verse 4. See, in verse 4 we read, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Those who had been scattered, you see that the task of spreading the good news of Jesus was not confined simply to the apostles. Indeed, as we saw from verse 1, the apostles are the ones who stay in Jerusalem. They continue to lead the church there to, to oversee the whole ministry as a whole. And so it was, it was regular Christians, if there is such a thing, who, who were scattered and they were the ones who continued to preach the word wherever they went. And I think that's remarkable. That despite the persecution that we were reading about, despite the, the unknown that they are then walking into, the one thing they could do was share the good news of Jesus. And isn't it a challenge to all of us that however we spend our days, whatever our role might be in, in workplace or family, I wonder, could we be known as people who preached the word wherever they went? The image it conjures up for me here is like, a, like an army of ordinary people spreading from Jerusalem, taking the message with them as they go to wherever they go. And then in verse 5, we're, we're introduced to Philip and Philip's encounter in a, in a Samaritan city. Uh, and that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning. But, uh, but what do we know about Philip? 
So verse 5 begins with Philip went down too. Well, what do we know about this man, Philip? Well, like Stephen, we're, we're introduced to Philip back in Acts chapter 6. Uh, and the church is setting up its, its ministry of service. It's, it's often referred to as deacons. And there was a dispute in Jerusalem, uh, in the Jerusalem church about food not being evenly distributed to those in need, in need. And so the apostles say in verse 3 of chapter 6, we will turn this responsibility over to a bunch of people that they ask the church to elect. There are seven men, verse 3 says, uh, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And then in verse 5 we read, and Philip was one of those. And so Philip is a man full of the spirit, uh, full of wisdom. And, and what we're going to see as we look more intently at his encounters in Acts 8 is that's exactly true of Philip. He was indeed a man full of the spirit and of wisdom. Uh, and so he's not an apostle. Uh, he's a deacon in the early church and he's been sent out or he is on his way uh, and he goes to Samaria. And so we're going to focus on verses 4 through to verse 25. Uh, and we're going to highlight a couple of things from these verses as we continue to think about the church on the move. And so we're going to see how this, this church on the move carries this message. Uh, as we read in verse 4, they preached the word. Well, what was that word? I think what we're going to see today is we're going to see God's message that went. And we're going to see how that message was powerful. It is a powerful message with word and actions fueled by the Spirit. And we'll also see how that message provokes a response. It is a provocative message. And, and that response is really a matter of the heart. And so we'll think a little bit about those two issues. We'll think more about that as aspect of power before we turn towards the end to think about how it is a provocative message. Um, but before we, we look at the message that goes out, perhaps it would be useful to keep in mind who Philip is speaking to here, the Samaritans. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if you are, how familiar you are with the Samaritans or, or what other biblical accounts come to mind when you think of the Samaritans. Maybe you can recall the, the parable that Jesus told of the good Samaritan, that, that stranger who helped to provide support and comfort to a Jewish man who had been left dead by robbers. And it was a parable recorded in, in Luke chapter 10. And one of the main plot lines in that parable was the scandal of a Jewish man being helped by a Samaritan. And that was scandalous because there were centuries of division and hatred between these two groups of people. The, the Jews and the, Mar and the Samaritans detested one another in many ways and, and refused to socialise or mix with one another. And so Jesus' parable was incredibly offensive to his original Jewish audience. I mean, how, how could a Samaritan do anything considered that could be considered righteous? Surely they were religiously unclean people. Certainly they, they were not God's holy, true people as the Jewish people were. And we see these cultural differences again in John chapter 4, where Jesus purposefully walks through a Samaritan area, which Jewish men just didn't do. But he encounters a woman at the well in a town called Sychar. And Jesus asks the woman for a drink. And when the woman, even the woman then acknowledges that how etiquette and, and tradition is being broken, she actually states, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then John adds this helpful footnote for Jews did not associate with Samaritans. And so it's clear here that there are social differences as well as religious differences between the Jews and the Samaritans. And these differences are deeply rooted. They're, they're ingrained into the culture of both groups. However, in both groups, in the Jewish culture and Samaritan culture, there was an expectation of a Messiah, of a saviour to be sent. But as Jesus explained to the woman at the well, he is the Messiah. He is the saviour. I am he, he says to her. He is the Christ, the, the one God has sent to save the world. And so we see Philip picking up the, those themes, that that. that message of the Messiah that has come whenever he visits the Samaritan city. And so if we look at some of the content of the message that Philip shared, we get an understanding uh, of what this message was that brought such power. And so we see him say, Philip in, in verse 5 of Acts chapter 8, Philip went down to, this, to Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. Later in verse 12, we see he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And so we see these themes here of Messiah, kingdom of God, the name of Jesus. Well, well, why is this all important? Well, it's important because Jesus is the Messiah. That is the message. He's the one who can save people from their sins, bring them into right relationship with God. He's the one who established God's kingdom. Indeed, indeed he's the king who, uh, who sits on the throne in that kingdom. And so because of his saving work, he has the power and the authority to sit on that throne. 
His name is Jesus Christ. He is the only one worthy. And because of who he is, the the very son of God, and because of what he's done, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, he is to be praised. He is to be obeyed. He is to be adored. That's the message that Philip proclaimed. He is the Messiah. This message of the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ. And that's the message that we proclaim today. We, We have this clear and joyous message to share and his name is Jesus. He's the one who has taken the penalty of our sin and defeated it so that when we confess our sins before him, when we submit our whole lives to him as our king, we might be deemed righteous before God, welcomed into his daily and eternal presence. This is the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So that's the message that Philip proclaimed. And we know from this passage, and indeed throughout all of Christian history, that that this message is one of power. It's not just words that we speak, but we know that God the Holy Spirit equips those who proclaim this message. And the Spirit's transformational power accompanies that great news. And so we see this when we pick up Philip's account again in verse 6. Let's read it through to verse 8. When the crowds heard Philip, and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. And as we've seen throughout the earlier chapters of Acts, and indeed throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus recorded in the Gospels, there were great acts of spiritual power that accompanied the proclamation of the good news of Jesus. And so we see people healed, we see demons driven out, we see these visible demonstrations that that were intended to provide evidence that the message that was being proclaimed was true. If you you think of Luke chapter 5, we see some friends bringing a paralysed man to Jesus for him to be healed. And when when these friends lay their friend uh, before Jesus, he says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew that they were thinking what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them took what he'd been lying on and went home praising God. You see, the miracle was to, be, was to be visible evidence to show the power and authority that Jesus has over the unseen. That, that, that internal transformation of wiping away sin and restoring hearts to God. We could know that that was true because Jesus also had authority to drive out demons, to heal the sick. And so here it is with, in Samaria with Philip. The, the signs and the miracles They're a wonderful demonstration of God's grace and his goodness and the restoration that is to come when God's kingdom is fully realised. But it would be totally wrong for these signs to be an end in themselves. Philip isn't a a travelling showman able to do fancy tricks. No, the signs are so that the Samaritans witness them and then at the end of verse 6 we see they saw the signs that were performed and they all paid close attention to what he said. See, the message that the powerful signs pointed to was greater than the signs themselves. The message that the signs pointed to was greater than the signs themselves. The Messiah, the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, that is the greatest news. And so they're backed up by these signs to show you have got to pay attention. And I I love verse 8. These eight words that, goodness, couldn't we, wouldn't we want to scream these over Belfast? These eight words, so there was great joy in that city. There was great joy in that city. Of course there was. With such a powerful proclamation of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, such visible signs of people knowing freedom that comes from his spiritual presence. Surely joy was the only outcome. Great and, and lasting and liberating joy. The joy of knowing sins forgiven, the the joy of knowing adoption by God as his son or his daughter, the joy of knowing God as our heavenly father, that's joy. And these Samaritans experienced it by the bucket load. And so we see here that the church 
is on the move. And as the church goes, made up of, of hundreds of individuals who continued to share the good news as they went, then we hone in on Philip in Samaria and, and we see here this powerful message. Words of truth that are fueled by the Spirit. And the, therefore the result is joy in those who respond. And as we move on, then we, we see uh, the more detailed story of one individual, the man who becomes known as Simon the Sorcerer. Um, but before we do that, as we've been thinking about the Holy Spirit, there, there's a potential confusing section in the middle of this story that I think it would be helpful to deal with first. Uh, and so this is sort of sandwiched in the middle of Simon's story, but let's deal with it on its own. It's from verses 14 to verse 16. So when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had, had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. You see, this seems to be a, a strange occurrence, doesn't it? And, and it could lead us to ask a few questions. Why did, why did the Samaritan believers not receive the Holy Spirit when they believed? Was there something incomplete about Philip's ministry that the Jerusalem apostles then had to come and, and fix in some way? Is this a pattern of, of church structure, which means that there are only a select few who can bestow the Holy Spirit on believers? These are, these are big questions. And indeed, they're questions that have caused a big difference in belief and practice within Christian churches. And the foundation of these questions can be, I guess, summarised in asking, when do Christian believers receive the Holy Spirit? Is it at the time of accepting Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, that, that moment of repentance? Or, or is the Spirit received at a separate time? Well, when we reach verses like this that cause us questions, uh, it's important to let the whole counsel of Scripture help us interpret specific Scripture, not, not just read one verse and take in that practice as, as normative. And so when we look wider than this one example, we do see that the Samaritan scenario is, is by far an exception to the normal teaching and practice of the New Testament. And so we'll come back to, to why there's a difference here and what we're to learn from it. But a, a quick summary of a couple of other verses will help us to see the normal practice and teaching of the early church, which of course we should then try to follow. Um, so firstly, staying within these verses themselves, we get an indication that there's something unusual occurring here. Uh, something that's breaking the mould of the normal pattern. Um, if you look again with me at verse 16. So Peter and John come from Jerusalem to Samaria because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had simply been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Or, or many other translations state they had only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Suggesting there had been something lacking in, in what was expected to have been experienced. That the normal pattern in teaching would have been that the Holy Spirit had been received at that time. If we go back even in within Acts and look at the day of Pentecost at Luke 2, uh, sorry in Acts 2, uh, we see the Holy Spirit demonstrating himself in powerful ways among the disciples. Peter then addresses the crowd explaining the good news of Jesus and in response to a question on how those hearers should respond to this message and Peter clearly says in verse 38, repent and be baptised Every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the act of repentance, having sins forgiven, receiving the Holy Spirit is one event. There was nothing extra that needed to happen at a later stage. The, the Spirit would be sent in that moment of repentance, of faith and forgiveness. And finally then, let's, let's look at Romans 8 verse 9. You, however, this is the Apostle Paul writing. Remember the persecutor Saul? This is now Paul writing. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So can you see that link? That the belonging to Christ means we have the Spirit. They are one and the same. And therefore there cannot be a time when you are a Christian that you have not received the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit indwells those who believe. And so hopefully those verses help to show that the Apostles' teaching is, is that to be a Christian is to receive the, the Holy Spirit. That's the normal pattern. So then we have to ask, why is this scenario in Samaria different? Why was the Spirit not received like, like normal circumstances, if we can say that's normal? Well, the good news of Jesus reaching Samaria was far from normal. 
remember the, the division and the animosity that we talked about earlier between the, the Jewish and Samaritan people? Well, with that, with that history, could it be that God sovereignly withheld his spirit from falling in order to show that his church would break down those long-held divisions, that, that his church would span the cultural and traditional divides? And so God ensures that there is visible unity between the Christians in Jerusalem and the new Christians in Samaria. You see, that the underlying tension and division between the Samaritans and the Jews had the potential to creep into the new Christian faith. And so this encounter shows that, that a confirmation that the Samaritan Christians were fully fledged and accepted members of the Christian community. And so Peter and John, the, these heavyweights, if you like, in the Jerusalem church, join Philip in Samaria. They warmly welcome the Samaritan churches. And in doing so, it's proved that they are fully fledged members of the Christian community. I find um, Jeffrey Lamp helpful as he explains that it had to be demonstrated to the Samaritans beyond any shadow of doubt, that they had really become members of the church in fellowship with the original pillars. An unprecedented situation demanded quite exceptional methods. See, rather than these verses providing a confusion for us, they actually demonstrate a real work of God as he, as he watches over and protects his early church. He's making it visible to the world that his love and his mercy and his grace crosses over all sorts of man-made boundaries of, of culture and religion and history and ethnicity or class. None of those boundaries count for anything when it comes to accepting the good news of Jesus Christ, when it comes to joining his church. And isn't that good news indeed? And so we've, we've seen the, the, the powerful message that Philip proclaimed with the Samaritans. And we've explored the the coming of the Holy Spirit to those believers. And so the final aspect of this encounter that we're going to look at this morning will take us back to Simon the Sorcerer, who we met before the visit of the Jerusalem apostles. So we are introduced to him in verses 9 through to verse 13. And his example shows that, that the message of Jesus is not only powerful, but it is provocative. See, Simon was a, we read in verses 9 to 13, he's a powerful influence in the city. He's, he's a man with quite the following, quite the reputation uh, and a pretty high opinion of himself. But he encounters Philip and he's captivated by the message and the signs that accompany that message. And we're told that, that Simon believed Philip's message and followed him. And then Simon witnesses the Holy Spirit coming on the Samaritan believers when the, when the apostles laid their hands on him and he's fascinated. And we see that the, the, the showman in him loved this ability, this, this power. And so he offers them money to be able to, in his mind, perform the same kind of trick. But of course, this spiritual act was not in any way intended to be a show or, or a performance. And it certainly wasn't for sale. And so Peter strongly rebukes Simon for his attitude, strongly rebukes him for, for his failure to understand what has really gone on. And we may wonder how Simon got it so wrong, but I actually think this morning we need to recognise a very serious warning in these verses. You see, Peter cuts right to the core of the issue with Simon when he says in verse 21, your heart is not right before God. These are, these are cutting words. These are provocative words. But these are inspired words as, as God has given Peter insight into what is really going on. See, Simon's heart was not right before God. But, but hang on a minute. In verse 13, did we not see that Simon himself believed and was baptised? So what's going on here? Well, I think what we see here is that it is possible to be wowed by the works of God. It is possible to believe that his good news is true. It is possible to be part of a church community, but, but all along our hearts are not right with God. You see, true and genuine repentance of sin and commitment to following the way of Jesus means a complete overhaul of life. And Simon's life just doesn't demonstrate that. We see it here in verse 23, as Peter says to him, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. See, Simon hasn't experienced the, the joyous freedom that comes from totally surrendering our hearts, our lives, our souls to Jesus. So he's still being held captive by the sin that separates him from the love of God. He's not allowed the message of Jesus to fully penetrate his whole life. And so, can I lovingly plead with us all in the way that Peter does with Simon that regardless of how long we've been around church 
or, or how impressive we think the teaching of Jesus is, make sure that we've given more to Jesus than just a casual nod in his direction. As Peter here says to Simon, the only right response, the only response to getting our hearts right before God is in verse 22, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you. You see, you see for each and every one of us, the opportunity to repent and be forgiven is there. That, that's, that's the truth and the joy of verses like 1 John, 4, uh, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1 verse 9. Jesus has done everything that is needed for our hearts to be made right with God. That's why he came to the world. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he rose from the grave and now is ascended in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Jesus' saving work so that our hearts can be made right with God is finished. And for us to know the reality of having our hearts made right before God, we have to give him our whole heart, our whole lives. Not just a a nod of approval or an appreciation of some good moral teaching. We must give all of ourselves to him. Because he gave all of himself for us. That's why this message is also provocative. Because it demands our all. And for, for some of us, that, that seems like too much. But if that's the case, then, then maybe, maybe it would be helpful to step back and see the fuller picture, the, the reality of what has been done for us. See, as we mentioned a few weeks ago, the reality of the good news can be seen in this verse from 2 Corinthians. That God made him who had no sin. That's Jesus. Jesus had no sin, but God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The enormity of that statement shows that giving our all to Jesus is the only fitting response. Because of what Jesus has done for us to make our hearts right before God. To remove the stain of sin from our lives so that we know relationship with the eternal, majestic, creator, loving, holy and and just God. That's what Jesus has done. That is the good news. And he did this all by leaving the glory of heaven, coming to earth as a man, dying a a brutal and lonely death before rising triumphantly from the grave. And as I've said, reigning now in heaven, waiting to usher in his kingdom in all its fullness. This is King Jesus. And this is the only one who gave himself for the world, the only one who could. So this message is powerful. But this message is provocative. It demands a response. And I pray, we pray, we we earnestly pray that you would know this incredible love. You would respond to him by giving your whole life to him and therefore be transformed into his likeness by his spirit, which will indwell you. See, God's message is powerful. God's message is provocative. God's message is transformative. Genuine faith in Jesus transforms our whole lives, our our attitudes, our words, our priorities. They're all overhauled because the root of our very beings has changed. Our hearts have been made right with God. This is the wonder of the good news of Jesus Christ. It, It was the wonder of the news that the Samaritans heard. It was the still is the wonder of the good news that we share today. The message is powerful. The message is provocative. And let's be people who respond to this message in fullness. That we give our all to him. And therefore we demonstrate the power of this message by living a a faithful, following, obedient life to our King Jesus. Let's let's pray together as we've heard God's powerful, God's provocative message. Let's pray before our Father. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the joy and the life that is in your word, that you give us through your word. Father, we thank you that in your word we see your great salvation plan 
we see the, the joy of the message of Jesus. Your son who came so that we, so that he who was not, who did not have sin became sin so that we would know the righteousness of God and we would be the righteousness of God. Father, we thank you. We, we marvel once again at this glorious good news. And God, we recognise that, that there, are, there are many times when, when, when we fail to, to lay our all before you, when we try to take back some control, some, some area of our life that, that we want to have our way rather than submitting it to yours. God, we, we recognise that this is a, a frighteningly common occurrence. And so, God, we, we pray and we do again confess that before you. And we thank you, Father, that we know that when we confess, you are faithful and just and you do forgive our sins. And so, God, those of us who know you, those of us who have committed our lives to you, Father, would we, would we know the empowering of your spirit again? Would you fall afresh, we pray? Would you fill us so that we may live this, this faithful, obedient life that you call us to live? And help us, Father, to share this wonderful, powerful, provocative message with the world around us. And God, I pray for those who are, who are tuning in this morning, maybe haven't submitted their lives to you. Father, would you work by your spirit? Would you help all of us to appreciate the, the, the wonder of the sacrifice that you paid on our behalf? So that, Father, your name would be glorified as we respond to your grace, as we live out the reality of your word, your truth, your power. So help us, Father, we pray. And God, it is for your glory that we ask all these things. And we pray that you would continue to move among us. In your wonderful name we ask it. Amen. Amen. I'd, I'd love to, if, if today um, you, you need to have a chat with somebody uh, about uh, a challenge in this message, or maybe, uh, maybe you have given your life to Christ for the first time, uh, would, you, would you please get in touch with us, help us to know, um, and help us to, to somehow in any way we can support you, answer questions, encourage you, pray for you. Uh, and, and so please do be in touch, get in touch. Um, what we're going to do now is not, a, is not a different bit of our sermon. This is a, continu or a different bit of our service, sorry. This is a continuation as we uh, come before our Father and celebrate communion together. And this communion meal demonstrates this good news of Jesus. It forces us to remember the sacrifice that Jesus paid on our behalf. It forces us to renew our hearts as we come before him again and give ourselves to him once again. It, 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 it helps us to proclaim the good news of Jesus. That Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread with his followers as he gathered in the upper room. He broke it and said to them, this is my body which is broken for you. This was a wonderful picture that he was given to his first followers that we continue in this example. To say that my body will be broken and it is broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Then he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The covenant God said would be written on our hearts, that relationship that we're welcomed into. The blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so that's why we do this meal. That's why we do it every week. And that's why even in this season, we're continuing to do this meal. It is good for us to remember, to reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus. To thank him for what he has done, to lay ourselves before him again. And so to help us in that, I'd love to sing with us um, and so we're going to sing the Lord is my salvation what a wonderful truth to declare as we come to his word when we reflect on on how that salvation plan came to be with Jesus giving his life for us rising from the dead let's sing together let's declare this truth together that the Lord is my salvation and so after that we'll gather the uh, that we'll gather the elements and we'll share that time together so let's let's sing where we are
So as we come together, hopefully you've had a chance to, to get your bread and your, your drink or whatever it is you, you do. Um, but let's reflect again on those wonderful words in Second Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so let me pray as we come around these elements. Father, we thank you for this time and we thank you for this reminder meal. And we praise you for uh, what it represents for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your, your willingness to go to the cross, for your, your body, which was broken, as represented by this bread, and your blood, which was poured out as we take the cup. We thank you for the, the depth that you were, you were willing to go to demonstrate your love, to, to pay the sacrifice of my sin, to take my sin, and impart to me your righteousness. So we thank you. We we again bring, bring our confessions before you and we, we pray that the, the sin that held you on the cross, Father, you would break its chains from us, that we would be released from the captivity of that sin. Thank you, Father, for your victory. Thank you once again for this meal. And so as the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth again, we say, well, 
For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if you want to share the elements wherever you are, and then we'll gather again uh, to finish our service together. So, our God, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your salvation plan. We thank you for uh, the glorious riches that await us now, all because of what Jesus has done for us. And Father, we pray that you would help us and that, that our whole lives would be a reflection of this great meal, that we would indeed proclaim the Lord's death. We would proclaim a powerful message. Jesus is the Messiah, the kingdom of God. He is the king that we would indeed declare the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as that message not only goes out from us, but is at work in us, would you continue that provocative work as we are shaped into the likeness of your Son? Give us grace, we pray. Part us with your blessing, we ask. As we go into now, whatever lies ahead of us the rest of this day, the rest of this week, we pray that you would help us to be uh, like those folks in verse 4 of Acts 8, that wherever we go, we would be uh, taking the, the message in the name of the Lord Jesus with us. So fill us, equip us. And we ask all of these things, Father, for your glory. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you once again for, for being with us. Uh, it is a real pleasure and a privilege to, uh, to be gathering together. And I, and I do pray uh, God's blessing on you, whatever lies ahead this week. So, uh, so may you know uh, the peace of God. Uh, may you know the joy of God. May you know the, the presence of, of his spirit and his people with you. Uh, and so we look forward to seeing you again next week. Remember, if you can join us tonight for the prayer meeting, uh, please do look out for the email this afternoon that will include the details of how to join that. Uh, and if there's anything that we can do to help with that and set you up with Zoom, please do let us know. And so take care and God bless and we'll see you next week.